Yeah, the president in Jamestown of an uh, organization called the Robert H. Jackson Center. Oh, yeah. And I really there's, there's an episode in the book about it. And I'd yeah. like you to talk about it because yes, yeah. uh, okay. here you started and your book starts literally in 1941 yeah. at Harvard. Yeah. And of all the things that I was reading it, I said, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> Bob Suedos, and here you are, part of the, uh, your principal assignment was the Ames competition. So yeah, I, until, I, until the judge acquired me. Yeah. 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 Tell, tell me how this how that worked. Give me the background of that uh, interesting episode with Justice Jackson. Give me the background. Well, uh, yeah, my I was uh, in Washington uh, applying for a job because that's where I expected I would end up, and I got a call from I think it was either Erwin Griswold, Griswold who was. Uh, later, the dean of the law school and the famous, you know, solicitor general and so forth, or it was uh, Jim Landis who had been chairman of the SEC and then uh, a leading creator of of uh, the statutes that regulated the markets, the uh, yes, uh, Securities Exchange and Law and the Securities Act of '33 and so forth. Uh, and they called me and said, no, don't take a job yet. <laughs> so I said, okay, what do you want? They said, I want, we want you to come back as a member of the faculty and run the Ames competition, which is the through uh, experience that you have learning how to write appellate briefs and make appellate arguments. Uh, in those days, it was, there was not a trial. It was an appellate argument learning experience. And you went through a competition. You had a team that prepared the brief and made the oral arguments and worked out the strategy and so forth. And uh, it went through your second year and your third year and the finals uh, were in the third year. Uh, they'd always had sort of routine cases that they used that I just suggested to whoever the dean was at the time, was either Jim Landis or Erwin Grizzled. I said, you know, why can't we have a current issue of importance? And I think that the one that would be fun would be the uh, issue that's coming before the Supreme Court as to the restrictions that the FCC wants to impose on the number of hours that a network can monopolize. Mm -hmm. And uh, they thought it was a good idea. They didn't really know what I was talking about. But I went ahead and I constructed a uh, record based upon the matters that had been submitted already to the court. So uh, also I said, you know, we've got to have somebody, a really uh, important judge on this uh, case to give it significance and to make it a, you know, an exciting time for the guys who had to work very hard sure. to wake up and make this up. So uh, <laughs> somehow or other it ended up was Robert Jackson, who uh, was probably the uh, most, not, not liberal in the sense of politics, but the guy who had a, he had the experience at Nuremberg, and he had uh, uh, later on, of course. Uh, but he, he, I always knew by reputation, and I think I probably have met him, that he was somebody that was flex, flexible enough that he would work into this uh, pattern. Well, uh, when it came out that these young men in their third year in law school were going to argue this important case, which was scheduled to come before the Supreme Court, the 
two of the three networks, I think it was NBC and, and CBS, protested and said uh, they didn't want the case to be argued by these amateurs yeah. <laughs> at the Harvard <laughs> Law School who were not really amateurs <laughs> by that time. And uh, so uh, there was a real argument as to whether we could have the case in the Ames competition. So uh, what happened was either Landis or Griswold decided they would submit it to Felix Frankfurter, who was then you know, a very famous uh, professor and uh, commentator on the law. Uh, and he was still on the faculty of Harvard Law School. So they submitted the question to him as to whether it was appropriate ethically and so forth for this case to be heard by the amateur law students before it was heard by the Supreme Court. Yeah, wow. Felix said he knew of no law that prevented the judges from learning something about the case before, <laughs> <laughs> before it appeared before him. They went ahead. So <laughs> it turns out, OK, we're going to go ahead with the FCC issue. And Justice Jackson agreed to come. <laughs> So uh, I met him at the railroad station, I guess. I guess. And uh, I had, over the three years of the law school before I was on the faculty, I had not spent much time in Boston. There wasn't time for it uh, uh, with all the work you had to do and so forth. So, so I picked up Justice Jackson, and we headed for Cambridge. Unfortunately, the wrong way on a one-way street. <laughs> so he had enough of a sense of humor, so he didn't, he didn't object to my turning around. So, so that, and that, the argument turned out to be fun and very well done. And uh, I, can't, I think what ultimately happened was the Supreme Court uh, approved the regulation that restricted the networks to prime time, in effect. Did you get a sense of Jackson at all? I mean, you had some a little bit of uh, exposure to him before, but certainly yeah. during that time period, uh, as to what kind of guy he was, was did you get a... Ref uh, well, I got the impression he was practical. The, uh, he was also uh, intellectual mm -hmm. and, uh, and had a sense of humor. Uh, the kind of a guy that would make a good professor or a good lawyer or a good judge. Right. And uh, I was, you know, I was pleased to have him there. And we had, a, I had a kind of a limited good time. After all, I was just a, a, just a recent graduate of the law school myself. So uh, I got that sense that, uh, as I say, he, he, we were lucky to have him. Did you, uh, uh, I know he was a very close friend with Frankfurter. Did, did you think that Jackson had talked to Frankfurter about the case beforehand or got it, did he, did he mention any of that? I don't think, I don't think so. I think he, uh, I think he, although they may have called him and say, you know, Bob, do you have any objections to this? Uh, and I think his answer was probably, that's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? Why not? Did your paths cross with his ever again? Do you recall? Uh, not really. He was uh, he was at Nuremberg, but I was in military government, and I was handling the civil uh, law problems of the occupation and the uh, property control and the concentration camp uh, issues, and uh, I was I was dealing with the law of Germany and the law of the United States occupation, which had regulations and laws and so forth. And I ended up uh, primarily as a, as a judge in uh, Wiesbaden, which was a, yeah. as a, a, in which I dealt with it turned out that there were so many of the cases. There were so many cases where uh, Germans uh, 
had been asked when they, when Hitler was running things, uh, everybody in Germany had to belong to one organization or another. Uh, the worse, the earlier you joined, the worse it was for you. Right. The more thorough your uh, work was probably the worst for you. Right. Uh, but in order to get promoted, in order to get maintained in the Nazi hierarchy, uh, they all tended to state very specifically what their offices were, what their training was, what their uh, awards were, and so forth. And those were spelled out literally in the records of those organizations. Then when it came to trying to get a job in the uh, non-Nazi hierarchy after, after Hitler had been destroyed uh, and we had taken over uh, large aspects of civil and criminal courts and so forth, when that happened uh, and they wanted a job, the rules of the federal United States government were that uh, uh, you had to state what your yeah. history was and uh, they all wanted to get jobs. You had to do that for any, something even as low as a, uh, as a foreman <laughs> in a plant. Uh, you had to get qualified. So they all lied. <laughs> Many of them lied. And uh, when our people examined them, they found the inconsistency of what they were telling us and what they had told the Nazi organizations. And uh, that, under our regulations, was a violation of the federal uh, occupation law. And they were all a lot of them were charged with violating that law. And there were so many of them that I had, this was in the, the what, they, what you call the, uh, uh, the part of Germany that I had jurisdiction over. I had to establish a special court because there were so many violations. And uh, in the course of it, I had to teach those lawyers who we held were uh, still non-Nazi enough that we could permit them to sure. practice. I had to teach them something about our law. For example, they had never had the right of uh, cross-examination. The practice in Germany and in other civil law countries is that the lawyer couldn't ask the questions of the defendant. He had asked the questions of the judge, and the judge decided whether to ask the, that question or some other question or what. Mm -hmm. So I taught these these guys, <laughs> a few of them who we, we qualified. Uh, I taught them cross-examination. I taught them, you know, some of the aspects of our law, and uh, it made it possible for them to have some kind of a practical practice before my courts. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Was that part of the denazification process? Yes, yes, it was. It was part of it. Uh, the, uh, you couldn't possibly have a functioning government unless you found some people that you felt were sufficiently non-Nazi or had not showed records that were not uh, anything more than just belonging to the Nazi party. Everybody had belonged to the, had belonged to the party. But if you were not uh, an Ortsgruppenleiter, which would be uh, a county executive, or were not uh, one of the other uh, titles, uh, you might be permitted to function in your community and in that particular aspect of, uh, of the occupation. Uh, so the denazification program was, you know, everybody was examined. If you wanted to be a, an important person in the occupation, you had to show that you 
had not imbibed the Nazi creed right, right. and so forth. So uh, it was uh, something like what they were going through in, did, went through in Iraq. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm not so sure that they learned the lessons of uh, World War II, but that's another issue. Uh, but it was, uh, was very challenging. Uh, you had to learn something about German law. You had to learn something about German politics. You had to learn something about uh, the, the concentration camps, uh, the attitude of the local populace about it, uh, the ability to, to save the remnants of the Jewish and non-Jewish uh, prisoners, uh, and somehow or other get them back into civilization. That was all part of it. You actually went to a concentration. You were at Dachau, weren't you? Yes. Well, I was only there for a short period of time, but I saw enough of it to, to uh, be shocked to death, especially the coal cars, mm -hmm. the things I describe in the book. Uh, I, had, <clears throat> I went by Jeep to uh, see what was going on because uh, some of the other echelons in the 45th Division had overrun the camp. Mm -hmm. And by the time I was allowed to get there, there was typhus. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I couldn't go in the camp. But I did see the the uh, coal cars. There were 40 or 44 coal cars lined up outside of the camp, full of dead and dying people. Because uh, what had happened was the Germans uh, were concerned about the onrushing Russians. Mm -hmm. The Russians were coming from the east, we were coming from the west, and uh, they were more afraid of <laughs> the Russians than they were of the United States. So they put them on these coal cars and shipped them off to the west. Mm -hmm. And they ended up, some of them ended up in Dachau, some of them ended up in, in Auschwitz, some, you know. And uh, it, as I say, seeing that, and I have a picture that I got from the Holocaust Museum that's in the book, it was just uh, horrendous. It was just uh, unbelievable. You, you actually have a section in your book about how uh, your Harvard education actually saved your life. That's right. <laughs> yes. 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 It took you off the front line into uh, kind of a management role. Yeah. <laughs> oh, about, uh, you know, two miles <laughs> from the front. I, let me tell you that I mean, known an awful lot about you, Bob, just from afar, and certainly the relationship with the Sabres, and right at the beginning, and all your negotiating skills to be right there with the Knoxes. The book, part of the book, which I found by far and away the most interesting, is the baseball. Yeah. That piece of Buffalo history was totally unknown to me. Yeah. And... It, it, I want to talk a little bit about that because I think that's a piece that most people don't know about. Yeah, yeah. Uh, literally 1957 with the backdrop of, you know, O'Malley and Horace Stoneman taking Brooklyn and, and New York out. Yeah, right. Kind of led to a backdrop where all of a sudden you're in the middle of it a couple of years later. That's right. How did that happen? <laughs> well, uh, I had a client by the name of Reg Taylor. Uh, he was a friend of the Shelkoffs, and uh, it turned out that uh, he, he had been a baseball fan. In fact, he had been the president of the Buffalo Minor League Baseball Club, and <clears throat> uh, had also been interested in hockey. Uh, found that out later on. 
<clears throat> and uh, I had handled some personal matters for him, uh, which he thought I had done a good job. Uh, the main thing was his, his mother had this complicated estate in uh, Newport, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, I had uh, he had called me up and said, the guy there doesn't know anything about tax law, and I don't know what to say. So he called me up, we flew there, and I straightened it out. So as a result, he, he had a personal interest and experience with me as a lawyer, and uh, he called me up and said, uh, I know Bill Shea slightly, I know Mrs. T Payson, uh, who was the daughter of one of the famous millionaires, or billionaires in New York City, who wanted to restore baseball. She was a baseball fan. She wanted to restore Major League Baseball to New York City. Mm -hmm. And uh, Bill Shea's idea of how to do it was to do what had happened in other sports <coughs> leagues. Uh, form a, an outlaw league, threaten the majors <laughs> uh, with uh, antitrust uh, suits and problems with the Congress if they didn't let another baseball team into the city of New York and to elsewhere where mm -hmm. people wanted a baseball team. At that time it was only 16, I guess 16, mm -hmm club. And uh, Shea's idea was that uh, that if he got this outlaw league going, he needed at least eight teams because he wanted it to look like a honest goodness league, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, not just a, a fake. And uh, he needed eight. And uh, somebody uh, got hold of Reg and said, how about Buffalo? Buffalo was, at time, that time was the best minor league club in the United States uh, from the point of view of uh, attendance and fan interest and so forth. So uh, Reg thought it was a good idea and uh, he asked me, you know, how are we gonna do this and what do you think about it? And I said, you know, Let's try anyway. So uh, uh, Shea also felt that he needed to have uh, somebody up front who was knowledgeable and would be known by the baseball fans. So he then brought in Branch Rickey uh, as the uh, front man, really, and the, the fellow, the, the expert on baseball. Mm -hmm. As it happened, Rickey had a had a uh, sore history with Major League Baseball because he had wanted to limit the Major League clubs to a certain number of players so that you'd have competition within the league instead of having one club build up a you know, an inventory of so many players that other clubs couldn't really compete. And they hadn't liked that. Uh, Judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis, I guess mm -hmm. what. And uh, so he had, he had a, a, a reason to participate in this thing. Uh, it turned out that the cost of be belonging to the league was $50,000. And uh, originally Reg, who was a very enthusiastic, a uh, very enjoyable guy to be with, <laughs> but really pretty tight sometimes. He said, what? Oh dear, sure. Yeah, that's me probably. Yeah. Oh, where was I? Oh. Reg, Reg Taylor, $50,000. So, yeah, he said, well, why can't the, uh, why can't the Bison Baseball Club pay for it? Mm -hmm. Why can't they be the applicant for the franchise. I said, well, that's what you want to do, Reg? I'll see if I can work it out. Uh, it turned out, of course, that Sports Service, 
then one of the leading concessionaires in the United States, owned the majority of the stock. The minority was held by people in the Buffalo community and they wanted to have a, mm -hmm. uh, the, the picture of a, of a local holdings. But Sports Service owned uh, a part of it, I owned the majority of the stock. So uh, as the thing was developed, and it was a wonderful experience for me, as it turned out, we had most of the meetings of the Continental League, it was what it was called, in Buffalo, with Branch Rickey and uh, the guy who owned uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs. Is that Jen John Cook? Yeah, Jack, Jack Ken Cook? Cook, who later owned uh, a hockey franchise in California. Uh, I got to know him. I got to know Bill Shea. I got to know uh, uh, the man to see, who, the famous lawyer, Washington lawyer. Uh, whose name? Bennett Williams? Yeah, Edward Bennett Williams. So I got to know the people in Minnesota who wanted, who were friends of Seymour's, mm -hmm. who wanted to uh, get a baseball franchise, but later on accepted a hockey franchise. <laughs> Uh, I got to know that it was just tremendous education and having Ricky there, he wasn't content just to sit there. He would lecture on every phase of, of professional baseball. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was really tremendous experience that you could get nowhere else. I mean, I got to know about the politics, who the, who the, the um, movers and shakers were, you know, what the problems were and everything else. So it was a, it was a very good education. But uh, when our efforts began to show some success, at least political or pop, popular success, the owners of Major League Baseball teams were getting, <laughs> making calls to Lou Jacobs, uh, who was the principal owner of Sports Service. Mm -hmm. Get rid of those guys. Don't let them join the Continental League. You know, we don't want them in there. We don't want to have to take anybody by force. We don't want to have, by that time, you know, we would had up to eight teams. Mm -hmm. uh, Kansas City, Denver, uh, Dallas, uh, Los Angeles, and so forth. Uh, so uh, I said to Reg, well, the only way that we can get the local club to be the participants, we have to force Sports Service to vote for joining the Continental League. And I raised hell in the newspapers and produced uh, a, uh, we filed a, a proxy statement uh, which showed clearly the Sports Service had enough votes to block it. But uh, the then lawyer for, uh, for Sports Service was Ed Jekyll, who was a principal in the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. And after this started, uh, the news, the Buffalo News, and I think the Courier as well, got on the bandwagon. You know, what are you doing holding off Buffalo from getting a major league franchise? And when that started to come out into the papers and so forth, Ed Jekyll advised, after a little coaching from me, <laughs> he advised Lou Jacobs, you got to go along with this. You can't oppose it. It'll hurt your business. And uh, I was in New York with, with uh, Jekyll when he finally agreed with me, capitulated, called Jacob and said, you gotta vote for this. So they voted for it and uh, the Continental League was formed with Buffalo as one of its participants. But as, as it happened, uh, Bill Shea's clout and our clout was not enough 
to get Buffalo in, the uh, uh, Shea and Mrs. Payson and his other principal guy uh, decided, well, if they could get four teams in, that was as much as they could do, and maybe later on they would get, yeah, so, so we uh, lost out when it came to the decision of the Senate committee that was uh, threatening baseball with antitrust problems if they didn't let more clubs into the majors. Was that the Kefauver committee? That's yeah, I think it was, yeah, yeah. yeah. How, that's fascinating. So what was the lesson learned from that whole process of the Continental League? Well, it, the, uh, I'd say is the, the technique was okay, but what you had to have, you had to have more money. Mm -hmm. You had more money up front. You had to have people who were more prominent in the local community. You had to have people within the uh, majors on, who were prominent owners in the majors on your side that were working for you within the confines of the uh, of the uh, leagues. Uh, and you know, on top of that, you had to have a team that was that was uh, workable, and you had to have. Uh, public relations and so forth. But the main problem was working your way into the confines, and the, the people who were running baseball, mm -hmm. and persuade them that Buffalo was a place that should be moved. One personality that's in your book that did have some play down in Jamestown, where I'm from, uh, was uh, Harry Bisgeyer. Yeah. What was he like? I. I uh, he was a nice guy. Yeah. Uh, I, I knew him slightly. But one of the things that we did in baseball, and we ultimately did it in hockey, and it worked in hockey, but it didn't in baseball, we felt we had to be known as baseball people. So uh, it wasn't enough to let, it wasn't Bisgar, who was the other guy? Stiegelmeyer, yeah, who'd been running, was a local politician of not great consequence, but he was running the baseball club, the minor league baseball club, uh, and so was Bisgeyer. And uh, they were not prominent enough or politically knowledgeable enough for us to do any help, to be of any help. They were really minor players in this thing. So we decided that we had, that we are owners, like Reg, like the Shelkoffs, like later on the Knoxes, but the Knoxes were not involved in baseball that much. But, uh, you know, people like uh, uh, some of our other uh, client prominent uh, citizens to be involved. So we asked and, and worked it out, so we were on the board of the Buffalo uh, Bison Baseball Club, so we could talk to people as mm -hmm. if we were. And I remember, uh, I only knew Bisgar slightly. <laughs> so one day I said, "Well, look, I want to be down there. <laughs> I don't want to be down there on the field. I want to be in the club, in the clubhouse, or <laughs> so that people will see that we are, you know, we are part of management." And so. So as I'm walking down there, this guy looks up at me. What the hell are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> so I explained to him I was his boss, <laughs> or one of them anyway, yeah. for about three months. <laughs> anyway, yeah. now, now was Ralph Wilson part of that Continental League gathering as well? Was no, he was not, but. Uh, uh, but uh, he was working on putting the uh, putting the team uh, arranged. He wanted to get into Buffalo, have a Buffalo franchise, and he wanted a stadium that was suitable. And the only stadium that was suitable for football 
was what we call the rock pile. Right, right. Uh, and uh, that needed uh, a lot of money, and a lot of money in those days anyway. I think it was three to five million dollars to uh, improve it so that it could be used for major league football. That was still that was still uh, the American Football League right. that he was trying to form, be part of. And uh, so Wilson said to the powers that be in the local government, yeah, you got to put some money in there. You got to, you know, you got to approve that arena. And so they said, how can we spend all that money for 10 games a year? Somebody says, well, if you got baseball in there, <laughs> then you'd have 150 games a year. You'd have 140 sure. baseball games and 10 football games. So uh, the local <laughs> gentleman of political strengths bought it. <laughs> the problem was that the sports service who still owned the majority of the stock in the minor league baseball club, they felt it was a terrible thing to do to take a club that was successful in 10 to 15,000 seat stadium and move it into a 45,000 seat stadium that wasn't suitable for baseball in the first place. Right. Bearing in mind that the distance from first base to third base is uh, 386 feet, <laughs> whereas the uh, width of a football stadium is only, I think, 85 feet or whatever, right, right. whatever it was. So uh, you had that problem, how are you going to put a, a football stadium in a baseball stadium so you can still see it from the end zone? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and. Uh, Lou Jacobs, quite properly, said, that's ridiculous. You're just going to ruin that baseball club because you can't sell tickets in a 45,000-seat stadium mm -hmm. for a minor league club that's used to being up close on top of the game in a 15,000-seat stadium. And of course, uh, but uh, Wilson prevailed, and uh, they went ahead and, and uh, added uh, the seats and did all the other things and ultimately the base the minor league baseball club failed mm -hmm. just for the very reasons that Lou Jacobs suggested. As far as our concern was, you know, we were we were trying to find whatever we could, any way we could get into baseball, any way we could get into hockey at that at that point. Our people were primarily citizens of the community and that, that wanted another major league team in Buffalo. And whether it was baseball or hockey was not a major concern. But as it turned out, uh, we, we got the chance to get the hockey club. And after four years of hard work and political negotiation and everything else, uh, got it. But before then... Yeah, what, what time is it anyway? 12.30? 12 12.30, 12 yeah. Yeah, I made a reservation at the Westwood for 1 o'clock. Oh, Is that okay with you? No, that, that would be terrific. Yeah, okay. Uh, 1968, you got a call from Bill DeWitt, senior, who yeah. was also interested in baseball. That's right, he was, yeah. He had been an owner of two different clubs. Mm -hmm. uh, very nice guy and very knowledgeable. Uh, and... Uh, the whole idea was a good one. I mean, this was still the, the best minor league club in the country. Sure. And uh, there were a lot of people in the baseball world that wanted Buffalo in. Uh, the problem was that, again, you have this monopolistic cartel approach to things. Uh, and it happened that the guy who was uh, really in charge of baseball at that time was Walter O'Malley, mm -hmm. who had moved his club from the East Coast to the West Coast and had taken Horace Stoneham, the Giants owner, along with him to the West Coast. 
So uh, the uh, say the problem was again getting in, getting somebody who is knowledgeable and who is has power within the league organization to back you. Uh, and that was a fundamental and to show up with a strong financial uh, balance sheet and people who could do things and get things done within the community. Uh, we thought we had all that, uh, but the problems began to uh, <laughs> began to multiply when DeWitt went on a vacation and went to Europe for a couple of months or something like that. And a lot of things happened while he was in Europe that I didn't have much control over, but uh, I tried. Uh, the first thing that happened was that <clears throat> the Watts riots took mm -hmm. place in L.A., but they also, there was a sort of a small r Watts riot in Buffalo. Oh, okay. Jefferson Avenue. It was quite far away from from uh, the stadium, but uh, it caused some concern in the major league, and particularly O'Malley. O'Malley called me and says, "Mr. Suarez, I understand you got some problems with your temporary facility. See, contrary to what Dewitt had wanted to have immediate." He, he wanted to have, he wanted to have uh, two years to go by in time to build a new uh, stadium. Right. Uh, but the uh, majors decided that they wanted. They were competing with the American League. The American League already had two additional teams. They felt they had to have two additional teams, and they had to do it in a hurry. And so uh, they decided that. They would only take in teams that were ready to play immediately. Mm -hmm. And that meant that Buffalo had to use the rock pile. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the rock pile was clouded by the events of the, uh, of the uh, uh, lots like riots. And as I say, that's when O'Malley called me and said, uh, you know, you got a problem with your uh, temporary facility. I said, there's no such problem. It's miles away. I got the police department um, and the mayor to give me certifications that there were no damages, there's been no problems in that area and all that jazz. But that gave O'Malley an excuse to stay with his two buddies Buzzy Vavese, who had worked for him in, in, uh, with the Dodgers, and John McHale, who had worked for him, or maybe he had worked for uh, the Giants. Right. So it became apparent that he was really plugging for those two guys. And so he had those two, t and they decided, uh, that for some reason or other, McHale, Vasey won on the West Coast team, and Vasey, uh I'm sorry, uh, McHale, uh, he was sort of going back and forth, and it turned out that there was a crowd in Montreal, which unfortunately <laughs> claimed to be ready to take a team and were not ready at all. And uh, so as a result, uh, what ultimately happened, in fact, uh, the day after O'Malley called me, uh, Young, one of the reporters for, it was either the Daily News or the Post, had this drastic column about how Buffalo was in trouble because of the riots, and people were afraid to go to the stadium, all of which was untrue. As it happened, we went right down to the wire and uh, at the meeting in Chicago of the majors, mm -hmm. uh, I got a call at 6 o'clock from Fred Flaig, who, F-L-E-I-G, 
who was uh, assistant to the president of the National League. And he said, Bob, get your gang together. It looks like you're going to get it. Wow. That was at 6 o'clock, I think, on a Sunday afternoon. An hour goes by, another hour goes by, another hour goes by. I get a call from Flag. Sorry, Montreal got it. Bowie Kuhn, who was at one point commissioner of baseball, was a lawyer that I'd known uh, in New York. I once later on had a, several years later, I had a luncheon with him and he said, Bob, we tried every way we could. I said, well, who was the holdup? He said, Horace Stoneham. I said, that was ridiculous. I never met Mr. Stoneham. We were never asked to meet with him. There's no reason why he should have had a so therefore, I felt he was a shill, to put it unkindly, which it deserved. He was a shill for Walter O'Malley. In other words, he was making as if he was the guy who was holding up Buffalo, but it was really O'Malley who wanted to protect his two guys, McHale and Pavese. So uh, we didn't get it there. Again, more experience. And uh, as I say, at that time, I was known as the greatest living authority on how not to get a major league franchise. <laughs> <laughs> but all of that was building its way towards, you know, your real claim to fame. It is, you know, with your friends, the Knoxes, uh, getting, getting NHL. That's right. We had all this background experience that nobody you, else had. How did you connect up with Seymour and, and Nordy Knox? Uh, I had represented a company called Transcontinent Television, which uh, was formed as a result of the fight for Channel 2 uh, in 1954. And uh, as a result of that fight, it's a long story that's in the book. It's, it's a good story, but it's, uh, as a result of all that, uh, in order to uh, force NBC to come back, because in those days if you had ABC, you had nothing, but if you had NBC or CBS, you had a value of property. And in order to force uh, NBC to come back to us after they decided to buy a, a UHF station <coughs> and take the contract away from us, our crowd were gutsy people. <laughs> We decided to hell with it. We will create our own network, which we did, and ultimately we owned. This company owned uh, seven television stations: five VHF, very high frequency, and two UHF stations. And uh, we were in the television business up to our ears for ten years. And uh, as a result of a series of things that happened, we made a lot of money for the people who were investors in that. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, from then on, whenever I had a project, whether it was a baseball or hockey or some other, or a theater, I was always able to call on those people. Mm -hmm. and they were the base f for uh, forming the Sabres. And the Knoxes got to know me because they had a, a minor interest in transcontinent television. I think the father did. And they saw me perform and saw what I did and the results that I and my firm had produced. And uh, as a result, uh, when the uh, opportunity came for a hockey franchise in the National Hockey League, they came to me to run things, and as, as, you, as I pointed out, I had, I and the Noxes had a unique experience in this situation, which helped uh, quite a bit to get the thing done. It took four years, but it was, and it was tough going, and a lot of dangers and a lot of nearly slip-ups and so forth, but we did get it after four years and held on to it, and 
Today, it's uh, yeah, very successful, and it could be a very successful financial franchise. It never was, it never was in deep trouble. Mm -hmm. Never, never. That was a fiction that the Regus has created. Right, right. Uh, along the way, you, you just as you learned from the uh, baseball experience, it was important to at least show that the Knoxes had some were hockey people, and you had to work with the pastors. Didn't you to to kind of get into the Buffalo Bisons? Yes, uh, uh, yeah. The same. The technique was the same idea. We wanted to be known. After we had uh, failed to get the franchise in 1967, which was the first expansion of the National Hockey League, when it went from six teams to 12 teams, we felt one of the things that we were advised was, you know, you got to be known as hockey people. You got to have an investment in hockey. So. We went to Ruby Pastor and, uh, you know, explained to him uh, our object, and he thought it was great. He, you know, he was very cooperative. But when we got down to 1969, when we got the franchise, we were told that the pastors would not be appropriate as owners in the National Hockey League, whether you argue with that or not, whether that was uh, fiction or whether that was uh, prejudice or whatever it was. But we were told and in those days, you know, when you're trying to get into a cartel or a monopoly, you, you can't argue very much with their... So I then said to Ruby and the Noxes as well, I said, you know, we can't take you as part of the uh, financing team we can give you something that is almost as valuable. And I worked out with him a deal under which uh, his company, uh, which was Pepsi-Cola product, uh, would have the pouring rights in the arena for so many years. Mm -hmm. And that satisfied Ruby and uh, we got him the dollars that he wanted, and we got the franchise. So that's how, how that turned out. Did, why do you suspect? Was it was it a, a? Do you think there was some prejudice there at that time? I don't know. It may be there were people. There, there were some of the people who were owners who uh, just didn't uh, think that uh, they wanted to have the pastors at the governor's table. Right. Just technically, how did that work? Because clearly it was they were the, in the American Hockey League, they had territorial rights. Did you just have to buy that? We had to buy, yeah. We had to buy the American Hockey League off, and we had to buy the pastors off, which we did with the tar pouring rights. Right. Yeah. Did you find it difficult going through for me? The progress was Oakland having to... Uh, Obviously, be disappointed that you were not one of the first six. Yeah. Uh, and then kind of work your way back door through Oakland. Uh, and uh, I know Bill, was it Jennings from the New York Rangers? That yes, yes. He, he's the guy who, after we were disappointed and we felt we were entitled, we were one of the best, as one of the owners said, you're the best lawyer, you're the best financed, you got the best people. But you're not gonna get it. Right. <laughs> so, anyway, after we got disappointed in that, uh, Jennings said to me, uh, "You know, tell your clients to calm down. <laughs> he said, don't, uh, don't get everybody mad at you because sooner or later the league is gonna come back to you. You're too good a crowd, and uh, you, you'll have an opportunity." And he was right. Uh, it was difficult because he then said that the Oakland team was in financial trouble even with Bing Crosby. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, if you can help them, then the league will be very grateful. So we put a million dollars, which is a lot of money in those days, 3,000 miles away just to get in the league, but that was the key. Right. Because they couldn't talk to us as if we were outsiders anymore. We, we had some substantial money in. We had a knowledge of the game, of politics, of the, of the league. We were, we were clearly 
highly qualified people together. So uh, we thought, well, we'll just transfer the franchise from Oakland to Buffalo. Same problem, Toronto and Chicago. Right. So uh, we couldn't. Uh, we couldn't do it then, so we decided, you know, we'll leave our million dollars out there, mm -hmm. along with people who had no had no assets whatsoever. That were making a, uh, they were going to make a big sports complex out of three, two pitchers and one field goal kicker. <laughs> <laughs> they were going to, you know, well-known players that were going to try to treat that as their PR. Anyway, uh, so uh, the time came to, uh, that the pressure from Canada was on, because Canada had been turned down at the same time we had been turned down. This is Vancouver? Vancouver, yeah. And uh, so as things happened, uh, we, again, uh, because we were insiders, we knew what the price was. We knew what the owners would, would accept. The original price was $2 million of the first expansion, and we knew that that wouldn't work. And we knew after working inside, we knew that $6 million was the right number, because that meant that each of the original clubs would get a $1 million. <laughs> and so uh, we worked that out, and we also figured that uh, we could increase the size of the odd from 10,000 seats to 15,000, which would satisfy the requirements. But Cleveland and Baltimore, who were vying for the could not. They did not have the physical capacity to increase their buildings. And that would require much more for them than it would be for us. So the combination of those things, getting the price up, to six million plus, and uh, having the ability to increase the capacity of the arena, which as you may remember, maybe was a tremendous job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, those two things uh, really moved us in as uh, the accepted applicants at that. Well, there's a great, great photo on page 118 of which announces Buffalo, Vancouver get NHL franchises for the 70-71 season. And the picture of Seymour Knox III, Clarence Campbell, and Robert Suedos. Right. Yeah, right. The power brokers of Buffalo. Uh, and, and I think Buffalo owes you such a huge compliment. I mean, they, 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 you know, this really, what has transpired to keep major league sports in Buffalo. It wasn't easy. <laughs> It wasn't easy for Wilson, but it was much easier for him. <laughs> yeah. But you've got to take a great great sense of pride in that. And, yeah. Uh, I know we're going to on our way to lunch here, Bob, but I've really worked your okay. pretty hard here. So thank you for it's your okay. time. Yeah, we're not far from here. And then if you could bring me back, I'd oh, appreciate sure. oh, it. I'd be but as I say, if you want to dress here or anything you want, you know, please so, be my guest. Terrific. And We'll probably have to spend another hour someday to talk about the Sabres. <laughs> yeah, okay. And it's, it's uh, interesting how varied the approaches of all these PR and reporters are. What's the, what's the surprising question most people ask you, to you? The, the one you weren't, weren't really prepared for. You know, because you, you wrote the book, obviously, and some people just want to know how to get started. It's the normal yeah. stuff. But every once in a while, I'm sure there was a kind of a knuckleball. You'd say, huh, that's interesting. Uh, well, you know, I, I think that what surprises me and what pleases me is the variety of questions. Mm -hmm. Some people, uh, I've had people call me from Vancouver, from Toronto, from New York, the piece on TV or not TV was wonderful because they've been through the, the hero uh, of uh, television. Uh, one guy came up to me and he thought it was wonderful. My analysis, my analysis of uh, the odds 
that a guy who's drafted will become a <laughs> will become a regular. Right. You know, he thought that was great. Uh, s some people, uh, I would say that uh, a lot of people like the episode on uh, the no goal game because mm -hmm. that's got so many elements in it. My favorite <laughs> is the McGillney Nightmare. <laughs> yeah, because that's got everything there. It's got law, politics, uh, the draft, the uh, international problems, uh, getting somebody like Amo Houghton, who was terrific. I mean, he was really a, a great representative to get us, you know, to get us so we could keep McGillity when the Russians were threatening to <laughs> put him in prison. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I like that, and it's also got a personal aspect to it because I ended up with that terrible disease that nearly killed me. Yeah. Uh, because contrary to the advice of Nordy Knox, I got off the boat in Russia. <laughs> he told me, Bob, when you get to Russia, don't get off the boat because the Russians don't like you. <laughs> so you stole their player. <laughs> anyway. I, I, as I say, it's a variety of them. I'd, I'd have to go down. Surprising. Uh, 